Hello, I'm Teresa O'Keefe. I'm on faculty at Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry. And my area is religious education with a particular focus on youth and young adult. And I was asked to facilitate this panel and plenary session, and I'm honored to do so. Uh, so I welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so far, I'm seeing 41 people present, which is terrific. Uh, today's plenary, Irresponsible Answers, is set within the larger theme of the conference of whose children are they? Responsibilities for formation of a new generation. And this plenary looks at the experience of religious communities being irresponsible in their care of rel and religious formation. And for our time together, we'll consider how religious communities and traditions have done damage in the past and continue in the present. And we'll also discuss ways we need to be attentive to the trauma that, is that has caused and how we might attend to that moving forward. As religious educators, we draw from diverse fields, uh, not only theology and education, but also fields within the social sciences to make sense of the work that we have to do in the context that we deal with. So this plenary gives us the opportunity to, to learn from three scholars, Ramona Grad, Christina D. McCleave, and Henry Zonio. These panelists do not claim to be religious educators or theologians, even though they may have contact with religious communities and be familiar with them. They will reflect from the perspective of their specific research interests and expertise on this topic. And in a moment, I'll ask each to introduce themselves. And in preparation for this plenary, I met with Ramona, Christine, and Henry to help them understand the audience of REA and who, to, who might attend this plenary. The REA community is international, as Elizabeth has already demonstrated tuning in from uh, uh, Australia. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's international, and while many of our contexts are impacted by colonial efforts and all that that entails, these researchers are in North America. And in our earlier conversation, we realized that this plenary might make more sense to all present if each panelist offered a little bit of background to what it is they're presenting. So we'll have three brief slide presentations interspersed into the discussion. And those pre presentations will kind of front load this conversation, our time together. And after each, we'll take a pause and kind of soak in what it is that was offered in those uh, brief presentations and have a brief, then have a conversation, a media conversation around what we've just heard and any questions there. After, um, and then, then we'll keep the discussion moving forward. So I'm going to try to be aware of the time and how the flow of the conversation is going, and I'll monitor questions. But I realize that as the time is passing, not everything can be kind of brought up in the moment. So if you have a, a comment or a question, let's use the chat function, as has been the case in prior sessions, which I think has been really effective. Okay? And uh, Alex is going to help keep an eye on that with me. Uh, we're imagining a kind of movements in four parts here, uh, starting with some, some background information that's kind of essential to make sense of what it is we're talking about on the, in, in, on the issue of institutional irresponsibility, and then an effort to understand generational trauma, what is that and how does it impact people, and then we're going to move to consider like more contemporary issues, what's going on where we are and what we can see and understand. Hey, uh, when that, we, yes? This, but hi, Teresa. Um, the people for the translation will try to say we should, should try to speak slow, a little slower to try to help them, all of you. Okay. Um, just do, I don't know. do what I can. <laughs> okay. Uh, as so, we're imagining four parts: the background um, of the situation that causes um, irresponsible actions. Uh, what is generational trauma? And then looking to contemporary issues, which can take us in a lot of directions. And I've got a couple in mind myself. Um, and then I asked the panelists to think about a question for, for us. And that is, is, what kind of research do they think that members of this community ought to be doing on questions around um, irresponsible um, formation? So let's see what they if they come up with something. Uh, and I'm going to, at this point, invite the panelists to introduce themselves. I'll call you each so that we know who's speaking when, and uh, then we'll dive into the topic. 
So Ramona, you want to start us off with a quick introduction? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, hi, Theresa, and hi, everyone. I'm very excited to see such a big number of attendees. Um, so my name is Ramona Grad, and I work as a faculty at the University of Texas at Tyler, and I am originally from Romania. Um, I joined and I was invited um, uh, this, to participate in this conversation um, from, and, and share from my expertise as a, as, as a, a clinician and more specifically, um, so I'm a licensed psychologist and I'm a licensed professional counselor. And for the past 15 years, I have worked in multiple settings primarily with adults with a history of trauma, both in the US and in Romania. As a researcher, um, my agenda, so I focus on investigating and understanding the impact of childhood interpersonal trauma um, and factors that may lead to healing and, and growth. Um, Theresa has asked us to speak just briefly about what what brought us to here and how we uh, shared uh, um, who we are um, talking about this, this kind of issues. And I will share briefly that what led me to study trauma is really witnessing a tremendous amount of pain and conflict at multiple levels. That happens like individual levels, family levels, but also communities at large, uh, including wars. And really the big question that I had and I still have is really to try to understand what makes people choose war metaphorically over love. Mm. Um, briefly, I'll say I join all of you from Romania. It's 11 past 11 p.m. here. I'm truly honored to be part of this panel. And thank you for all of you who chose to spend their time in joining us. I'm really excited to have these conversations with my colleagues and with all of you. Um, and I really come with the hope to become more aware of these issues and hopefully uh, lead to some change later on. Thank you, Ramona. Excellent. Henry, would you introduce yourself? Um, yes, hi, my name is Henry Zonio um, and I, I too would like to extend my thanks to um, Teresa and also Karen Marie um, for um, inviting me to be a part of this. Excited to be on this panel with Christine and Ramona. Um, so I am, um, like professionally, I, I'm an administrative faculty at Asbury University. Um, I'm a sociologist, um, and my areas of study um, that I do is taking a look at how children learn about, um, right now, how children learn about race and gender within the context of Sunday school um, and Christian education, religious education spaces, um, and the implications of that, what that looks like, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that more a little um, later. Um, as far as like how I came to this area of study, um, so before grad school, I was actually in children's ministry. Um, I was doing Christian education for 12 years. I'm at various places. Um, and in the midst of all of that, um, I mean, I found myself interested in um, spirituality, children's spirituality on the academic side and kind of seeing that there needed to be more of a bridge between practitioners and um, those in academia. Um, and then as far as studying like race and gender socialization, um, I tell a story of my um, daughter who's now 21, but she was four at the time at a church I was at. And when I went to pick her up after an event, um, the, the worker who was watching the children let me know that my daughter had, um, and another friend of hers had excluded another girl from playing with them because the other girl's skin was too dark. Um, and so that was a huge surprise to me. I mean, I'm half Filipino, so I have like, I have brown skin. My dad is, is who's Filipino has darker skin than me. It's like, we don't talk about that sort of stuff. So it was kind of interesting. It's like in the church that I was a children's pastor, where um, we we're supposed to be talking about people made in God's image, like where did my daughter learn this? Um, and so that has led me into the areas of research that I'm looking at. And so trying to figure out how, 
how do we, um, especially specifically, taking a look at how within especially religious education spaces that we reproduce a white patriarchal imagination, Christian imagination. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how I come to this research. And um, one of the reasons why um, I guess Karen Marie asked me to, to join in with this. So excited to, to hear from all of you. It's great seeing people from all over. Um, and for those of you who are up in the middle of the night or early in the morning, thank you so much for that. Thanks, Henry. And then we'll finish the introductions with Christine, who also will then lead us off on the first discussion. So if she finds herself moving from one to the other, go right ahead. Okay, great. Thank you um, for that, Teresa. And Buju, Indinawe, Magani Duke. Dindizi Indigenikaz, Makinak Waju, Indunjaba, Mikizi Indudame. And what I just said to you in Ojibwe language or Anishinaabe Moan, my language um, is greetings, my relatives. My name is Dindisi, which means blue jay. And uh, my full name, my English name is Christine Dindisi McCleave. I am Turtle Mountain Ojibwe and I am Eagle Clan. Um, and that's what I said in my other language. Apologies to the translators. I did throw you that curveball. <laughs> so um, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I am uh, coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, the traditional homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. And I am a uh, generational survivor of US Indian boarding schools. And I was the CEO for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition for some time. Uh, currently, I am a doctoral student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the Indigenous Studies program. Um, I did my master's degree in uh, leadership and I focused my thesis on Native American spirituality and Christianity and really looked at my family history of um, this interaction between our traditional native ways and Catholicism, which is how I was raised. I was raised as Catholic and uh, it, did, it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> so, um, so I'm kind of, you know, getting a little bit into my presentation with this introduction. So I might as well just go ahead and launch that. Let me just um, figure out how to do that. I'm doing that. And now I believe you are all seeing yes, the yes. PowerPoint. Okay, great. Um, okay, so so yeah, so we we uh, as panelists got together and and kind of, you know, agreed, like Teresa was saying, to give you this overview and some, uh, I'm a big fan of historical context. It makes all the difference, right? Um, you can't fully understand a subject unless you take a step back and look at it big picture. So I think it's always important to, um, when we're talking about the impacts of Christian um, education in the United States, which is, you know, um, largely the the religious uh, perspective in this country or has been for centuries and you know is really um, kind of intertwined in our uh, political system and an evidence of that is the doctrine of discovery and this idea that came from that of manifest destiny that the uh, European settlers who were coming to Turtle Island which is what uh, we indigenous people call North America, that um, they felt it was, you know, God's uh, divine plan for them to come to these lands. And that is largely a result of a series of papal bulls that were issued, um, the last one being in 1493, which literally said that if um, people of European uh, Christian Catholic descent found lands that were being inhabited by non-Christians in Africa and North America and anywhere they were colonizing around the world, that they could claim those lands for the church and the crown. Um, and so these, um, this doctrine of discovery, these ideas led to this um, westward expansion as depicted in this 
image here, which is a painting by John Gast from 1872 called American Progress. And you can see they are chasing all the indigenous peoples and the buffalo um, out of the way to make, make way for their westward expansion. Um, the Doctrine of Discovery has been cited by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. I could also cite for you uh, a bunch of legislation uh, from the early years of this country's history, but we don't have time for all of that. Um, all of that just to say that you know, this, this idea has been baked into the formation of this country and, and the systems uh, throughout this country. Recently, um, the Pope did repudiate this doctrine of discovery. Uh, it started, you know, a decade ago, certain denominations started repudiating the doctrine of discovery after hearing from indigenous peoples for so long that it was, you know, we felt it was very wrong and very racist and used to justify taking of our lands thing. So, um, you know, various denominations started repudiating and people were calling on the Catholic Church to also do that. I never thought it would happen in my lifetime, but it did just happen this year. Um, and then upon reflection, I realized that um, repudiation is not the same as rescinding that document. And of course, that is what the Catholic Church will probably never do because rescinding a papal bull sets a pretty bad precedent for any pope to undo a previous pope's work. Um, so they're probably not going to actually rescind it. But as long as it still exists, if it's not rescinded, it still exists and can still continue to be cited by um, you know the Supreme Court and other other places uh, in this country and around the world. Um, and it's certainly also not the same as reparations or repairing the damage that has been done. But repudiation is essentially an admission that it was it was not good, it was wrong, and shouldn't have been done. Um, but it's kind of like a an, an empty apology. Nothing changes because of that. Um, so you know that's a little bit of the hi historical context and in, in how religion has has shaped how colonization has impacted indigenous peoples. Another example is the ghost dance movement, um, which led to the Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890. Around this time, it, you know, around the end of uh, the 1800s, um, not only was the Civil War happening, but the Indian boarding schools that were run by the government were starting to expand. And this was a, an example of what had already been going on with um, boarding schools and Christian education in this country. Um, and so the government then just made it like an official policy and actually passed legislation to give money to the churches to run these schools for Indian education. And um, so it was illegal at that time for native people to have their ceremonies to pray and gather in their traditional ways. And uh, this ghost dance movement was, was basically like an underground movement to pray in secret at night. And that's what this painting is depicting here. Um, and and uh, the government literally, you know, sent the cavalry in to, um, to kill them because of it. And they were praying for the revitalization of their ways, for the survival of their ways, and at and for their children who were literally being taken against their will at this point in history. So that's a little more of the historical context. And then um, my personal experience with this is that my great-grandfather pictured here, John Willett, he went to Carlisle Indian Boarding School, which was the first big federal Indian school in this country. And although it was a government-run school, um, they did make the children go to church and um, gave them all Christian names and sometimes uh, gave them birthdays if they didn't, if, if their family and tribe didn't track birthdays the same way. Um, they would assign them a birth date and they would often give them um, Christmas or the 4th of July or something like that. Um, and then my grandfather also pictured here in his Navy uniform went to a Catholic Indian boarding school. Um, and then as I said, I was the CEO for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition for some time where we advocated for uh, the government and churches to be held accountable to these policies and um, to these actions and impacts on 
Native people, uh, which are still, um, the impacts are still with us. There's ongoing trauma, intergenerational trauma, which Ramona is going to talk about. But when I did my master's thesis, uh, this is the title, it, you know, academia, the titles get long. <laughs> this, I don't like the title, but here it is, it's done. Um, and my findings from that research really quickly was that um, there are there is a spectrum of spiritual religious practices among Native American people today. Um, this was not an extensive survey. It was an interview, um, a qualitative study, and um, just here in the Twin Cities. But I suspect that this would be very similar in other populations. Um, so there are a number of Native people who remain to this day Christian by choice, voluntarily um, embracing um, their Christian religion. And then there are other Native Americans who have rejected Christianity and quote unquote returned to their traditional ways. And then there's a lot of people also in the middle blending um, practices and uh, theologies and, and, and being very synchronistic in, in their uh, religious and spiritual practices. There are a lot of areas of compatibility as well as conflict um, between these two um, religions, if you will, um, because the native traditional spirituality varies from tribe to tribe and it's not technically a religion. Um, but there is also some ongoing harm uh, and colonization due to some dogma in certain um, denominations that is still intolerant to pluralism, intolerant to any um, traditional native uh, spirituality and practices and continue to, to preach that it's evil or demonic to, to this day. So um, that's still happening. Um, so I just like this quote because it really sums it up. I know I didn't have much time to, to dive into this, um, but for native people to follow Jesus, they can best do so not by becoming Christian, but by following their traditional ways. Any religion that is based on exclusivist notions of salvation necessarily becomes a religion tied to conquest and empire. And I think that really encapsulated, encapsulates that very well. Um, so yeah, so I'm sure we'll discuss this more as our panel moves on, but that's my little uh, contribution to the historical context for you all. Let me unmute myself first. Thank you, Christine. Are you going to ask us to just pause for a moment, have a kind of take that in and kind of resonate with you? Is there anything that um, is news to you or particularly remarkable for yourself that you just kind of want to hold on to for a moment? All right. I want to uh, in, invite immediate comments or questions, uh, but I want to one one I have, Christine, is say a little bit more about the um, the relationship between the government funding and the religious schools. It 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 seems to me, from my impression, that uh, but you can give me more data. Is it that uh, there in fact were more religious schools than schools that were non-religious? So that was um, part of the work that we were doing at the coalition was uh, researching uh, how many schools there were and if they were government run or church run. And so that research is still ongoing. And um, uh, in 2021, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Hallin, launched an investigation into the government's um, boarding schools. And so they'll come out with a report, hopefully, you know, in the next year or so that gives more detail about that. But uh, at the time that I was at the coalition, we had found, um, you know, 370, approximately 370 schools that were run here in the US and about half of them were run by churches. Um, there was some schools here and there that would, you know, start out as religious and then um, become you know, government run or that were remained religious and were receiving funding. And so the two pieces of legislation that made way for the government to actually pay those um, Christian schools was um, the Indian Civilization Fund Act of 1819. 
So this is around the time that they were still making treaties with tribal nations and saying, in exchange for this land, we will give you education and health care and rations. And um, so they, they set up the fund, but they named it <laughs> they named it the Civilization Fund. So there was an agenda there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then Grant, President Grant's peace policy, which uh, ran for several years, but you know we could say ended probably in 1869. Um, that peace policy specifically said that the money from the Indian Civilization Fund should go to missionaries because they were actually having a problem with corrupt Indian agents. So under mm -hmm. the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the people that were responsible for administering these funds um, were, were told to hate Indians. There was a motto at the time called that went, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Mm -hmm. And it was um, Colonel Pratt who opened the Carlisle Indian Boarding School who changed that motto as a Christian man to say, um, say uh, kill the Indian, save the man. Mm -hmm. And so these boarding schools are part of that process of killing the Indian who's in the child and saving the child, but making them more European. Absolutely. It was blatant. Yeah. Yeah. And while your work is in the United States, and thank you for your perspective on this, um, also know the same kind of thing is happening in Canada. Um, but I also imagine that there are other initiatives happening in other parts of the world with other communities. Uh, I see a question from uh, Sola. Sola, would you like to ask your question? Yes, please. Well, um, just a comment. I, well, more of a comment. And um, well, I, I hope this comes out right. Yeah. So the the network. Uh, kept bringing me in and out but you know hearing Christine the parts I heard and seeing her different pictures came to my mind you know like uh, growing up and seeing Indians with these funny caps and all that and um, native wears and um, like oh so she's an Indian you know like she looks like an American like not like those Indian pictures, you know, the stereotype stuff. So, but um, on a more serious note, the things she has said, I can resonate with them because a lot of that happened to us too in Africa where people came and um, sent the original owners packing or at least made them feel like they were doing them a favor and took over things. And that's part of what I was raising earlier where hospitality is abused because mm -hmm. sometimes it's like it comes like an agenda to an agenda to exploit and um I, I i just thought okay this this helps it's sort of therapeutic to hear that it happens to some other people in other parts of the world and i think the key takeaway for me here is um, in spite of all of that, Christine says i chose myself to be a christian it's a personal decision that that that's encouraging because there are other people too who are making decisions based on that, though there are some who are really, really bitter. So I guess the question that would end my comment is, how can we help those who, I'm not sure if this is within the scope of your discussion, but how can we help those who are really bitter coming from backgrounds like this? Uh, how can we help them to overcome the bitterness that they have as a result of the exploitation they and their ancestors have experienced. Thank you. Thank you, Sola. And I think that's an excellent question. Let's see how that question gets attended to, whether it's answered directly or indirectly in the course of our time together. Terrific. And I also see uh, uh, Elizabeth in the, in the chat saying the same thing in Australia with the Aboriginal people. So yes, when we were talking in our preparation, we knew this was not a unique experience to North America, but in fact, a global phenomenon. And CJ, do you wanna contribute something here? Yeah, thank you, Teresa, good to see you. Um, and Christine, thank you, thank you for those words. Um, I'm also doing research on uh, boarding schools and specifically Christianity's diseased imagination as uh, many scholars call it when it comes to these narratives of conquest. 
And um, so far, my research, I traced it back to, you know, as far as back as, as uh, Eusebius in his history, ecclesiastical history, um, where he Christianed uh, Constantine as kind of the second coming of Jesus in some ways. Um, and, and so that's, you know, and Cornel West is also uh, very well known for saying that that's when Christianity transitioned from a prophetic form of Christianity to a more imperial form. And unfortunately, I see Christianity still within that framework. Um, even the prophetic strands are very much tied with empire, church. Um, and as, as you know, the Vatican statement has received a lot of um, credit, but I don't see it as going far enough for the reasons you say it does not repudiate. And also, um, there's a, a statement in it where it says that, you know, where Francis says there is no culture that is superior to another culture, but he doesn't go as far as saying there is no religion <laughs> superior to another religion, right? And so again, the Catholic Christian primacy um, and, you know, the colonial matrix of power, which Christianity is so much part of, um, it's just, uh, I see it as just very hard to disentangle even the prophetic liber liberatory kind of expressions of Christianity from the colonial matrix of power. So um, I don't know if you have any thoughts to share, but thank you um, for your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, CJ. All right, so there lovely um, chatter going on in the chat and I really appreciate kind of the interaction that's happening over there. Uh, we wanted to kind of move along um, with Henry here, who's I think going to add a slightly different perspective to the process just to enrich it, expand it. And so, uh, Henry, are you ready to jump in? Yeah, no, and actually, it's a good segue. I mean, CJ, what you're bringing up with, like, there's it's like the church continuing to reproduce the legacies of colonialism, right? Um, and so, I mean, part of the research that uh, I've been doing is trying to theorize, like, how do we do that? I mean, as a sociologist trying to figure out, like, okay, what are the, all of these different factors that lead to churches, specifically within re religious education spaces, what are we doing, whether explicitly or implicitly, that are reproducing these legacies, that are um, contributing to these legacies? Um, I mean, specifically, my research was taking a look at like race and gender, but I mean, we know uh, those of us who, who study all of this know that that's all linked to like colonialism, right? Um, and uh, colonial forms of like what, I mean, even our understandings of what race is and what gender is and all these different things. Um, so my area is taking a look at um, socialization. And so some of you may, a lot of you are probably familiar with different um, theories of socialization. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up here. But um, just to give a framework of where, there we go. Um, and so this is um, just a, a framework of how we, we look at socialization and then want to complicate it a little bit, which might give us a better understanding of like, why is there this persistence of um, inequalities that um, are linked to the church? I mean, we take a look even within recent history within the in the United States, and we can look at this globally in different areas where we have this this resurgence and not I mean not that it didn't exist, but it existed, but just this um, um, uh, reinscribing of like whiteness within religion. Um, I mean, within the US, we take a look at voting trends and white, white Christian nationalism and all these things. It's like, why is this happening? Um, because if the, the model that I have here, I mean, those green circles are just, would be people like children, volunteers and stuff within our religious education spaces. So, I mean, a lot of socialization theories look at institutional spaces as individual spaces. It's like, okay, well, you go into a church, you interact with people, you're socialized into religious norms and whatever norms are there. Um, the problem with this is that if this were, if this were the model, if this was all there was, then it would seem that would be easy for us to root out colonialism, root out racism, root out like misogyny and all these things, because we just need to change the culture of our institution um, and just treat kids like teach kids how to to treat each other nicely. And then that would just change the change what's going on in there. But um, what's actually and 
one other way that we can look at it then is like, well, if it's not just the institutional space, we also need to make sure that we're taking into account like dominant cultural ideologies from wh wherever you are, whether it's the United States, whether it's Canada, whether it's um, uh, in other countries around the world, that there are dominant ideologies that exist um, that have been shaped by these historical legacies that Christine has told us about. Um, and so those have become cultural norms that are embedded into legislature, that are embedded into everyday life, embedded into the stories and stereotypes we tell about people based on skin color, based on ethnicity, based on all of these different things. And so there is this back and forth that happens where these institutional spaces are shaped and influenced by dominant cultural ideologies. But again, this in and of itself doesn't really explain why we continue to persist and why it's so hard for us to disentangle the legacies of racism, the legacies of colonialism from specifically within this context, our church spaces, our religious spaces, our religious institutions. Um, and so what I found um, as I've talked with children, spent time um, in religious education spaces, most of the spaces that I've spent time in are um, Protestant spaces, but, um, and you can talk a little bit about like areas of research further, but this is sort of what I've been finding is, um, happening and why it might give us a better understanding of why it's so hard to disentangle um, areas of um, colonialization, um, racism, misogyny, um, homophobia, all these different things that um, are a part of larger culture, why it's, it's, they seep their way into our religious spaces. Even spaces where we are attendant to those issues, where we want to make sure that children are not being racist, that children are being aware of, um, of, of, of issues of, of gender equity and all of these other things, um, is that not only do we have the dominant cultural ideologies, we also have the, the culture of the institutional, specific institutional spaces themselves. So it depends on as far as like with religious institutions, churches, are you going to a historically black church? Are you at a predominantly white church? Are you at a, at a Hispanic church? Those, those spaces have their own cultural milieu that affect the institutional spaces, right? That, um, that affect what's going on. But the biggest thing is for me and what I'm finding is the material and symbolic culture, specifically the curriculum um, that we use in these spaces. Um, and a lot of, of churches use written curriculum. So um, just like Christine was talking about how legacies of manifest destiny and the doctrine of discovery get put into legislation, these make their way into curriculum, right? Um, and how we envision what it means to be Christian and who is who is a good Christian and what are the Bible stories that we uh, attend to and what do we pay attention to and what do we leave out? Um, so these curricula get written and published, and they don't get changed very often because it's expensive to change all of these things. And so all of that material and symbolic culture gets used within the religious education spaces, and mostly by volunteers, by people who aren't trained in education and pedag uh, pedagogical theories and all that stuff, um, because we're most religion, most churches are volunteer-led organizations. We we um, vo we rely on volunteers to teach our Sunday school classes, to teach these different um, cate um, catechism classes, other uh, spaces for religious education. And so, what we're seeing, or what I'm seeing, is that the curriculum itself, which has been shaped by dominant cultural ideologies, been shaped by um, the cultural milieus of these institutions um, make their way into the religious education spaces. And those don't change very often. Um, and so one of the things that I also um, talk about and I can talk about a little bit later um, is that there are certain things that are left out of our curricula. Um, so, I mean, most of us, if you take a look at religious education curriculum that's written for children, 
um, race is left out. They don't talk about it. Um, in, in fact, it's it's a lot of times it's written out of the curriculum when it, you could actually talk about issues of, of race. Um, I mean, the same thing comes with gender equity. So there's this null curriculum, which um, Elliot Eisner, who is a um, in education spaces who theorizes about curriculum and how we write the curriculum, he talks about null curriculum, this what's left out. And so what I'm finding is that what we're leaving out, which are things like race and colonialism and misog like all these different things that we leave out, um, we've created an ideological vacuum. And so that vacuum gets filled with all of these other ideologies. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's trying to figure out like, uh, how do we disentangle stuff? Well, we, we need to attend to things like the curriculum. We need to attend to what's in our spaces, those religious education spaces. What, um, and then how do we then weave in um, what's already there within the biblical text and within um, our values as Christians, how do we intentionally include those into the religious education spaces? Um, but by leaving them out, um, we're just allowing them to proliferate in those spaces. Thank you. Um, thank you, Henry. That's really helpful. Again, I'm going to ask just for a pause, let people just kind of soak something in and see what rises to the top for you. If anybody has an immediate comment or question now. Um, Elizabeth, go right ahead. Henry, I, I find it really interesting that how race uh, and problematic issues have been left out of our curriculum. But I want to um, add in that at times the religious education uh, element can be um, uh, counter to, to the dominant culture. And so um, back in the 60s, 1960s, 64, in fact, um, our Sunday school material written in Australia dealt with and introduced us to uh, Martin Luther King and um, and uh, Carver. I, I, I can't remember his first name, the peanut man. And I was amazed. Um, you know, literally, uh, that was in our curriculum. And, and I became aware of, um, as a, a teenager, aware of the problems in the United States. The problem was our Australian situation, our Aboriginal people and, and all of the, the oppression uh, and the massacres, etc., was not talked about in our Sunday school material. It was interesting that it was the US stuff. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's uh, yeah, I haven't looked at Australian curriculum. And so that, I mean, so that speaks to like within the curriculum, like including those things in there introduces those those issues. Um, so that's really cool. Like I, I, I haven't seen that, but I mean, again, like you were saying within your context in Australia, leaving out what's actually happening in your context, um, thinking that, oh, well, we're just, I mean, we're teaching one of the things that came up um, as I was doing the, the, the research gathering data, spending it's doing a lot of ethnographic data at these churches, ethnographic study, um, the, one of the biggest things that came out, like as far as like when I would talk to people is there's, and it seems bad to say this, and I'm not meaning a bad thing, but the, the emphasis is like, well, we're teaching kids the Bible, and that's great, but to the exclusion of everything else, assuming that everything's just going to fall into, it's like, well, we're going to teach children Bible verses and Bible stories, and they're going to catch everything else, um, and it, it's, it, it's mostly about information, Right. And it, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, religious education associate, but it, that's the emphasis. And so it's like, well, we're teaching children the Bible. It's like, well, that's great, but that's not just what you're teaching children. Um, and so, but yeah, no, that, that's, that's hopeful to, to hear that that was included in, in curriculum that you were using there. And I'm seeing that more often that publishers are starting to do this um, as they are 
rewriting their curriculum, revisiting their curriculum. Um, and one of the things that I, I talk about too is that it needs to be a part of the, the natural part of what happens in the curriculum. That it's not just like, hey, we're gonna do a series on racial justice. It's like, well, that's nice, but like we need to, it needs to be a, a normal part of what goes on. And I appreciate what you're saying and a point that Christina made earlier about it, it becomes so baked into the culture that we don't see it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's as if saying, you know, how do we make how do we make a cookie without flour? You know, it's like, well, we can't possibly take the flour out. It would be something different. Um, so we must keep it in there. And so I think it's it's a real it's a real challenging thing. But it's not necessarily a bad challenge. It's a good challenge. But I think it's a very it then becomes threatening to people to say we couldn't possibly do things differently. We couldn't possibly change things. All right. I'm going to. I see Sola's there, uh, but I'm actually going to ask her to put it in the chat, and we'll hold on to that for a moment um, to move on a bit. So because I don't, I want all of these pieces to kind of come together. Uh, and I and we're beginning to talk about the impact on people. So I'm going to invite Ramona to come into the conversation and share what she has to offer. Uh, yes, absolutely. Just one second so that I can share my screen. And I don't know why I don't, don't see it here. Despite the fact that I'm teaching online for the past three years, it still takes me a minute each time I'm trying to do this. So my apologies. <laughs> okay. Works now. So I love this conversation. And of course, through the lens of what I'm ab about to talk, um, I heard these multiple terms or for some reason just stood out to me. Uh, both from what Christine has mentioned and shared with us and also Henry is this idea and of um, using the power to overpower the ones that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe in those moments, not so much in control, or also this idea that the dominant, uh, the dominant culture or what we're not talking about, so to me, as a as a traumatologist, this idea of power and control um, really stood out as I was listening to you and really uh, connects in, uh, very nicely to what we're going to talk about um, now. So transgenerational religious trauma uh, among children and how, the impact on on their communities on the communities. Um, before I start talk about this these things. I want, you know, I always ask myself and the students that I work with, why do we talk about these things, right? Why is it important to talk about religious trauma and the impact on children? Uh, based on current studies, we know that about 27 to 33% of US adults have experienced religious trauma at some point in their life, right? So about a third, from US adult population, uh, they reported um, they have experienced some form of religious trauma at some point in their life. This in itself brings up some um, already, I, I already identify, we all can already identify some important gaps that are, that are uh, present in the literature and in our understanding on uh, religious trauma. Number one, is that I did not find a study that investigates religious trauma among children. And all the research that we have nowadays is based on reports of adults based on their experiences as children, right? But we do not interview children. So we don't know their experience. And second, no study that investigates religious trauma among children and adults worldwide. Right, so we know this is a prevalence in the US, but we don't know what happens in the world. So just a couple of things to be mindful of. So everything that I'm going to share today 
is based on the limited knowledge or the limited data that we have, right? Because we we're all informed from different places, but in terms of numbers and data, this is uh, we we know now not not enough. And this we'll come back to uh, this maybe towards the, the end of our conversation, right? When we talk about what can we do moving forward. Before I talk about all this situation, based on and based on the numbers. I can make a guess that, so we are now 53 participants in this, in this meeting. So if we just make an estimate and one third, and I know that we joined from across the world, uh, but I'm going to make a, um, a wild guess that probably there are people in the room that have experienced at some point some form of religious trauma. Um, it is not ever easy to talk about these things. So if you ever feel tr triggered during what I'm going to talk about, just know that it's okay. These reactions are very normal. Uh, it's never easy to talk about these things, but it is very important. So despite the fact that I'm not going to share any sort of graphic details, just the nature of this conversation might be triggering for some of you. So I will remind you to just simply breathe and whatever you might find yourself, remember that you, whatever you feel you experienced in the past, um, or if you're feeling stuck or overwhelmed, or just feel some sort of discomfort, just breathe. And we hope that you, um, you will continue to stay in our conversations. So before, again, I, I preface a lot the conversation about intergenerational trauma, because there are some things that we all need to be aware of. Um, Christine already shared some of examples of, of, uh, of uh, trauma, like um, the doctrine of discovery. We know about um, uh, a lot of forms of trauma that happens at um, uh, community levels. Um, but what I'm going to talk now and what I'm going to spend a couple of minutes is really to make a differentiation between what we call and what the literature talks about and being called spiritual and religious abuse and trauma. Because uh, uh, in spiritual and religious abuse, uh, we know that, uh, so the model that you're seeing on your screen now is actually a replication from the power and control wheel model that is being used in, in domestic violence and any sort of interpersonal uh, trauma. But it has been replicated because what we see in our understanding of religious trauma is that actually it replicates that model, right? So we see an over- uh, a misuse of power and control that inter in, intervenes at uh, different relationship levels between religious leaders and community members, between uh, parents and children, uh, between uh, just different members of community and their children. Uh, not going to spend too much time on this, we do not have, but just something to be aware of because it is very important when we talk about is one thing to talk about abuse, and it's completely something else to talk about trauma. Now, trauma is a hot topic nowadays, and everything seems to be uh, traumatizing, uh, and I, it is very important to clarify this. While it is important to recognize the abuse, not all forms of abuse uh, lead to trauma, right? So psychological trauma as defined by American Psychological Association is really um, that disturbing experience uh, that results in significant fear, helplessness, dissociation, confusion, or any other disruptive feelings long, intense enough that interferes with personal functioning. More simply said, is that psychological trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event. It's the damage that uh, it's being done to the brain that occurs because of this event. What I share here on the screen is, uh, is the difference between the normal brain and the 
the brain on PTSD, and we uh, we have data to support, and we see images of the brain uh, of individuals with PTSD that look very, very different. So we, ne we know that brain changes uh, as a consequence to a traumatic event. Um, so why am I talking about this? Because a lot of the times what we hear is the language about, well, this has happened in the past. Why, do, why don't you just get over it? So that uh, lack of uh, validation or the dismissal or denial. So people are asked to just get over it. With, uh, and so it's very important to understand that they cannot get over it, even it happened 100 years ago, because we know for a fact um, there are changes that happen starting with the brain level, uh, physiological, emotional, cognitive, and all, uh, all sort of changes. Now, finally, I'm going to talk about religious trauma and what religious trauma is. Again, I will remind you there is a big gap in understanding of religious trauma in children. Uh, most of the literature focuses on adults reporting their experiences of abuse that happened to them in childhood. There are many ways to talk about religious trauma, of course, but I'm looking at it through a clinician, uh, through a clinical lens. Um, so religious trauma, it's the physical, emotional, psychological response to religious beliefs, practices, or structures, any experience that happened within religious and spiritual spaces that overwhelm an individual's abil ability to cope and feel safe, right? So there are multiple events that happen in spiritual sacred spaces that overwhelms individual's ability to cope with that. Uh, trauma survivors and religious trauma survivors, they make a res reference of life before and life after. Because what we do know for a fact is that the whole life shifts, uh, their whole meaning of life is changed. So we, we know that survivors do talk about life before and after. And what happens is that within, uh, through those events that they experience, um, they feel extremely overwhelmed at multiple uh, levels, whether it's again, physical, uh, physiological, physical, emotional, cognitive, their brain is, is changed and um, they just, they don't have the abilities to respond to whatever was, uh, was it happening. Religious trauma shifts the way one perceives the world. And now you can imagine how, because this whole shift that happens, children are in itself much more vulnerable. If we just think about this developmentally, children, uh, children's brain, so our brain develop, um, uh, the highest level of development happens in the first three years of life. So if we think about the young children, if they are exposed to any sort of uh, religious traumatic events, you can only imagine the, the effects that it may create. And finally, we talk about generational trauma, right? It is very important to understand these concepts before. So we talk about, um, you know, the generational trauma. Um, it is, you know, a form of collective suffering that can be caused by extreme, extreme events or prolonged periods of difficulty. Uh, the idea that the trauma can be passed down from a generation to another is a relatively new concept from a researcher perspective. The concept of generational trauma was first recognized around uh, uh, 1966 as psychologists uh, start to study children and grandchildren of people who had survived the Holocaust. Um, and one study from late 80s found that grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were overrepresented by about 300% in referrals to psychiatric care. So researchers since then have spent much more time investigating. And now we have data that supports the fact that there are actually genes that transmit from a generation to another. 
so we know for a fact that um, this, this, you know, you will find in the literature terms like generational trauma, transgenerational, intergenerational, sometimes even historical trauma um, as a shared experience among a group of people. And again, we talked about this earlier and you all provided some example, colonialism, the doctrine of discovery, um, what happened to aborig aboriginous people in Australia, um, right? So unfortunately we have many, many examples of these. And what happens is that untreated trauma in, in the parent or in a community is passed down on the child through, um, through explicit messages sometimes, and sometimes implicitly just by behaviors and uh, implicit messages or genes, uh, right? So things they're not, we're not even, uh, we're not even aware of. And I will leave you with a quote, right? And uh, that it says, the proper time to influence the character of a child is about a hundred years ago before he is born. We talk about this uh, transmission, transmission of generational trauma over multiple generations, um, right? So if we want to see a change, uh, we should have started a hundred years ago, but you know what they say that it's never too late. So probably um, um, it is very good that despite that it's uh, only talked about now, it's still very important that we talk about uh, today. So hopefully we'll see some changes in the near future, maybe not in just a hundred years from now. Thank you, Ramona. Excellent. Now again, I'll give people a chance to just pause and collect a thought or an impression. Um, and if anyone has a comment they want to make or a question they want to raise, please do so. But I'm just going to turn to my panelists, the other two, and all three of you actually, and say, is there something that you've heard from one of the others that you want to ask about or comment on or augment or... Ramona, you're nodding your head. <laughs> Uh, yes, one of the things that actually stood out from uh, what I heard from Christine at the beginning um, is that you very beautifully you talked about the impact, unfortunately, right, the impact um, on communities at large, and two things that stood out, uh, the ghost dense movement, the fact that and this is something that actually we see that it's it's happening, so not all individuals that experience abuse and trauma stay in that place, but they go into healing. And I see that as a form of, um, of um, fighting against and taking the power back, which is, which is something that we see that, and it's possible actually healing and, and um, growth from, uh, from that trauma is absolutely possible. And we see it in examples in different communities, but also at the individual level. So just like such a beautiful, a uh, way of them, again, to take that power back and in the ways uh, that it was possible. And also I heard a need or a desire uh, when you talked about uh, the need um, for people uh, to be held accountable uh, for what they did. And it, it, it's such a power that it's such, uh, uh, so much power lies within that. But because it's not only that individuals who were exposed and experienced any sort of abuse and trauma, they're validated, right? So it's real what happened. And at the same time, um, it is, is that thriver need for advocacy and to implement changes. So things like this will not happen in the future. Yeah, I'd love to respond to that. Um... Thank you for summarizing it so succinctly. Um, I think that's probably why I was doing so much advocacy work at the boarding school healing coalition um, 
I created all the programs in three areas. One was education because we needed to raise awareness, not only among the general population in this country um, about this history, but amongst native populations as to how it was impacting us and um, to get people talking about those family histories. But then uh, the other areas that I created programs around were justice and healing, because yeah, ultimately we wanted pe to support people in their healing, um, but there was that component of justice. And um, I find myself in that arena again, because my new area of study is very related um, in looking at how to heal myself, my children, my, my family, my community, um, and offer, you know, that information to others on healing modalities, because we were asked about that constantly. Um, I discovered that a lot of people were using um, peyote religion, which is the Native American Church of North America, which has a very interesting history, because we got the American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in the United States in 1978, but we had to have a separate act for our religious freedom because we weren't even considered citizens until 1924. So um, people using the Native American church, which I you know, mentioned uh, is some um, is pluralism in you know, theological perspectives, um, but also using the traditional plant medicine that was there for you know thousands of years being used by indigenous peoples in North America and incorporating the traditional ceremonies, the ancient, you know, millennia old ceremonies with the language, because the boarding schools also impacted the language. So it's it is it was a revitalization movement. Um, but now, fast forward to uh, where we're at in 2023, there's a psychedelic renaissance and uh, people all over the country and all over the world are starting to legalize or decriminalize some of these entheogenic plant medicines. And right now, peyote is um, actually endangered. Its ecosystems are being um, endangered. And so there's a need for peyote conservation, as well as the ongoing harm of colonization, because in the context of, hey, our ceremonies used to be illegal, then we got our American Indian religious freedom, and now New Agers are culturally appropriating our ceremonies. It's like mind blowing. So I find myself in this same kind of like education uh, justice and advocacy as I continue to pursue my healing. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's a fascinating area. And the, um, there are also religious um, institutions and, and different denominations, uh, chaplains and, you know, Harvard School of Theology, they're all taking an interest in psychedelics as well. So you're probably going to start seeing some of that um, move into your circles as these powerful um, plant medicines really do help people feel closer to God or feel more spiritual. But mm -hmm. I think it's important, like I said before, that we know the, our historical context so that we don't do damage, so that we don't culturally appropriate what at one point we tried to genocide. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christine. Ramona, just respond to that. Yeah, because I was thinking what also that led me to kind of reflect and bring back one of the things that Henry mentioned, what do we not teach, right? Because in order to teach and learn from your past, you need to know your past. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that we live leave out, right? And I, I, I'm assuming, uh, again, I'm making a, a, an assumption about this, but all of us from uh, across the world, I'm sure that we have examples of the things that we have not learned in school about our culture, but also about other cultures, right? So how can we change? if we don't have the full picture? And what are some, some of the many things that we don't teach? Yeah, so many, so many things. And there's just lots of 
threads here that I kind of want to pick up on. One is the, the, the question of what stories you need to know in order to repair uh, to Ramona's point there, and I'm thinking of Elizabeth's example where she, sir, sure, she used, she learned about what was going on in the United States, but she was not learning about what was happening within her own cultural context. Uh, and so I'm thinking about also, as she said that, and, and Henry's point, I'm also thinking about the pushback that we're experiencing, certainly in the U.S., but probably other places in the world about, no, you can't tell those stories. You know, and we're going to legislate so that you can't tell those stories, even though there are people saying we must tell these stories, we must know our histories better, and we must understand both this, the good stories that we have buried and the stories of pain that we refuse to tell, our own, our own painful uh, perpetuation of damage. Henry, it looks like you wanted to jump in. Um, yeah, I was just um, wanting to add a little bit to that, just as far as like, you know, the leaving out these the again going back it's like this idea of the null curriculum it's like so when Elliot Eisner talks about it he he says it's like by leaving stuff out that limits the the imagination we have to talk about certain things and even conceptualize certain things so by leaving these things out things like colonialism things like I meaning you know, to speak to Christine, like the history of um, boarding schools and stuff like that, that doesn't give us a way, we leave it out of the religious, like where our religious space is, so we don't have a way, and the children who are coming through um, either our Sunday schools or catechesis or whatever it is that we use for religious education, they're not given any language that links like liberation with religion right that I mean and we would want that that religion religion is this liberatory um force but we we leave that out of the those educational spaces so they don't even have a way to put those together um and so again we end up perpetuating the dominant cultural ideologies um Sola had put it in the um, in the chat, she had mentioned like the AME Zion Church and other African American denominations. They emphasize a lot of these themes, like as far as like when it comes to racism. Um, and so that when we, because a lot of the questions like, well, what do how, who do we look to? What are some models? It's like, well, we look to, and Christine also brought this up in Ramona. We look to the mar we have to look to the marginalized communities who have been oppressed and what they're doing to push against the erasure of these histories. Um, so like with um, one of the churches that I spent time at, a historically black church, um, they used, um, they were part of, the, they're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. So they were using curriculum that was put out by the Southern Baptist Convention. And not surprisingly, it's a very white curriculum and they were very aware of it, but because they were historically black church, they weaved in their history into their conversations with the children. So a lesson about Solomon and going to church and the importance of go to church, which building the temple, and that's problematic in and of itself, trying to draw those things. But a lesson about the importance of going to church, they weaved in the history of their own church and how they had to, they started off meeting in small, as small groups in homes because they, they, were, they weren't allowed to um, meet as a church. And so their church started under oppression. And so that became a part of the lesson. So it, it got built into what was going on there. So, um, so not only do we need to be aware of the history of oppression and make sure that they're a part of, but we also need to take our cue from marginalized societies and how they're pushing against and using their power to subversively, subversively um, fill in these spaces, the, these areas of null curriculum. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, it, I think the, the biggest area, it's like, so in our predominantly white spaces, we're stuck going, okay, what do we do? It's like, well, there's already people doing this, like, who are dealing with these issues. Um, so we just need to get our, take our cues from those uh, oppressed and historically oppressed and marginalized communities within religious spaces on how do we fill in um, what's being left out. Mm -hmm. 
And we, I think requires turning our attention very differently off ourselves as the answer people, as white people saying, and I speak to yes. myself as a white person sitting here saying, you know, we're, do I have the right answer? It's like, probably not, you know, turn around to somebody else and, and, and humbly learn, uh, and try as best you can not to take over. Um, but to use the, the term that was used earlier, hospitality, don't abuse the hospitality of another who is offering you resources or a glimpse into the world as they see it and express it. Yeah. Yeah. So we have about 14 minutes left in our time together. Um, it's amazing to me how much got kind of unpacked, but also so much more could possibly be said. Uh, so does anyone else want to jump into the space before I have more ideas of my own? All right, Russell. Just want to thank all three uh, of the presenters. Such so great to hear, and and so great to hear sometimes from people outside of our guild, and and your perspectives. It's very helpful. I, I just wanted to touch and connect to what several of you said, and especially Henry with the uh, uh, no curriculum. We talk about that uh, quite a bit in my seminary courses, especially here in Texas. Obviously, we're, it's very intentional. In the past, I used to talk to my students about, you know, the, the no curriculum that we don't realize, you know, that, that our schools don't even recognize there. Of course, it is an agenda here. I mean, which we've talked about just for indigenous people, right? It was very much with the schools. You can't learn your language. We're not going to teach you your language or talk about your culture. It's such a powerful, oppressive tool uh, the no curriculum, and here in Texas that we have that. And so I, I talk to my students about for their churches, we have to pick up the slack, you know, of, of, of telling these stories, of getting these perspectives. And I've been so proud. One of the things we have, have a very diverse uh, student body. And so, you know, the dominant culture, predominantly white congregations, you know, bringing in other voices of, of people in color, of, of color, uh, you know, African American congregations, bringing in some of uh, their their former uh, LGBTQIA plus students to tell those stories. We have a, a two spirit woman who's a, a pastor uh, and a leader who uh, lends those perspectives and tells those stories. Uh, in part because it's important for religious communities to hear them, but in part just because it's part of being a well-rounded, educated person. And when you offer these programs to the community and to the youth of the community, uh, it's sort of filling in some of those gaps uh, that are very intentionally being forced into our public schooling and even colleges, right? In Texas, we can get into trouble. Uh, by talking too much uh, about diversity um, and uh, inclusion uh, and equity, uh, or or even being allowed to have those programs anymore in our our colleges. Mm -hmm. So I, I just what you're talking about is is so vitally important. All of you, thank you. Thank you, Russell. I had asked each of the panelists if they thought that there was something that members of this group. Uh, ought to be investigating or considering in, in research projects in the future. And I wonder, if among the three of you, is any, did anyone give that thought and have a have a recommendation? So, Christine, you get you're nodding away there. What do you suggest? I always have thoughts and recommendations. Excellent. I'm so glad you asked. Um, yeah, I really, it's more, um, you know, a, a teaching moment a story uh because that's how my people we that's how we do we tell stories and then you're supposed to infer out of that um so but i'll be a little explicit about why i'm telling the story so um recently i was contacted and asked to be on an executive advisory committee for a whole denomination which i will not name but they, um, I had, you know, been advocating for years that they and other denominations research their boarding schools that they ran and um, that they put funding 
to do that research themselves, you know, behind that initiative. And, uh, you know, after the unmarked graves that were shown in the news that were showing up in Canada and people in the US saying we have them here too. Uh, and I know where, you know, several of those locations are, we do have those unmarked graves from those boarding schools where children died um, here in the US as well. And then the secretary launched the investigation. Finally, um, denominations are starting to do something. And so this one denomination reached out and said, we'd like you to be on this executive committee. And I, um, and it was a very generic letter. It didn't say anything about, you know, because of your work or because we know who you are. It just said, um, because of your commitment to X denominations mission. And I was like, I'm not even, I've never even been to that denominations church. Um, so that was weird. And then, um, I replied and said, you know, I'd be happy to help. Of course, you know, I've done research in this area, are you offering an honorarium for my time and emotional labor? And their response was no. And I understand that a lot of these initiatives are volunteer in academia. We are, you know, always um, expected to write articles and do things for free, you know, just to get our work out there. But in this regard, I, you know, being a generational survivor of these boarding schools um, and uh, a a former, you know, professional in this area and, and currently a paid researcher in this area. I've done some primary source research for organizations. I was very like, this is not striking the right tone. And so I sent them a nice letter explaining all of this and saying, you cannot ask Native American people to do this work for free out of the goodness of our hearts, because this is um, you know, you are the perpetrators and we are the victims that were harmed. So come on, you know, so that's my little, that's my little teaching moment to share with everybody. And so, ex, you know, explicitly, um, you need to consider, you know, who you're asking to do that kind of um, heavy emotional work, you know, if it's an area where people have been harmed or might have that intergenerational trauma, you know, think it through, approach it relationally with indigenous peoples. Um, it's not a transaction. Sending a template letter without customizing it or trying to establish a connection is not the way to go, uh, especially around sensitive topics like this. Thank you, Christine. Ramona or Henry, any requests? Ramona, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure who was going to go first. Yeah, um, so kind of connected to what Christine mentioned, even the fact, so um, I would say to, to expand and do more research investigating the experiences of those who were um, uh, traumatized, right? And exposed to any forms of abuse. That in itself, not only, it does so many things at the same time, First, we need to talk more about these things so that we can understand, so that we can make changes in the future. Uh, second, uh, we this is a form of uh, giving power back to those that were um, disempowered and give their voices back. So really hear from them rather than us making assumptions about what, what was happening. So... Um, so create that space uh, to have more conversation. One thing that we actually do now. Um, and going back to, just to keep it brief, I'm aware of time and I also want to leave uh, time for Henry to do more investigation among children, right? Because the children that we see today will be the adults in the future. Uh, I will remind all of you, I'm sure you are all very aware, so just a reminder, we don't have, there's no research investigating children and how they form their spiritual beliefs, what is that they are taught, what they are taking away from what, uh, what um, they are taught, their experiences, again, spirituality is defined differently, but we don't know enough. Uh, how they form. So again, that's spiritually development, but also 
uh, their experiences of potential uh, religious trauma. So let's uh, let's if we want, I I will come back to to my quote. If we want to see changes in the future, I think we need to look more into our children and really understand their experiences, so that we can uh, we can see changes in the future. Thank you, Ramona. And Henry, you got a couple of minutes. Yeah, real quick. So mine's more on a practical level because I know many, some of you, a number of you um, teach at seminaries or divinity schools and stuff. I mean, people who are training to go into ministry. Because um, as I talk with different um, people who work in children's spirituality and also like who are in religious education spaces, the biggest question that they have is like, I mean, on the practical level, the practitioner level, like those who are working in children's ministry, children's formation at the church, at churches and stuff, they're like, that. this is all good information, but I'm not the one, like, have to answer to my senior pastor. I'm going to have to answer to parents and other things like this. So I guess my charge is for those of you who are training ministers at your schools, like future ministers, is, is to make them aware of these issues. I mean, let them know that, hey, these are things that um, you need to attend to, like with those who are overseeing things like spiritual formation, children's spiritual formation, children's ministry, youth ministry, other things like that. Um, but to take the to take the lead on that of how to um, help the congregation also come alongside this, um, because as I mean, as, especially with the our current climate, at least here in the U.S., of where it's like, okay, we're going to like ban all of these different things. We're not going to allow people to talk about it in public spaces and public education. Um, churches need to be the spaces where 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 this is talked about. Um, and and it's all well and good for those who are practitioners in children's spiritual formation to know about it but they can't make these decisions on their own. Um, so I guess that's just a, as far as a challenge and a, to put for those of you who are training ministers, future ministers, that um, this is something that requires their lead on it. Um, thank you, Henry. And thank you to all three of you. Oh, Ramona, you jumping back in? May I, just, may I add just one, one minute uh, really connected to what Henry mentioned? Um, and I'm making, again, an assumption here, and my apologies about that, but what I see in, so I work with future mental health counselors, and a lot of them come to this field because they want to create a change due to their experiences in the past. So my assumption is that maybe some of those that choose to go and be and train and go to religious schools and become ministers one day or pastors, whatever, they have their own experiences. So if we, if you know, those conversations happen and education happen and trainings happen with them, not only that it helps them, but it helps them helping others, right? So it's just like it's a ripple effect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, this has been really, I found this to be really interesting. I hope the, the members of REA have found this to be an interesting experience. I want to thank our three panelists for joining REA for the day and for the time and sharing your expertise. It's really been excellent. Uh, Alex has put in the chat to, to check out the announcements, add announcements there. Uh, also, please fill out the feedback form there. And otherwise, our time is coming up to an end. Uh, and I see Sola's got her hand raised, but I'm not sure I'll be able to get to it. And, and Von Clums also has his hand raised. Yep. No, he didn't. Okay, he was clapping. All right. <laughs> uh, let's, oops, she disappeared. Okay, so let's thank a round of applause for Christine and Ramona and Henry. Thank you so much for your time today. This has really been uh, insightful.